We are so glad you've chosen to worship with us today, and as usual, we have a lot going on. First off, there's an open house. Loma Linda Academy is one of the ministries here at the Loma Linda University Church. We really believe in Adventist education. On February the 26th, which is next Sunday, they will be having their annual open house. It will be at one o'clock for the elementary side, and then junior high and high school will be at three o'clock in the Heritage Room. If you have wanted to know about Loma Linda Academy and are interested in finding out more information about this amazing school, please stop by and check them out. And then on March 1, starts a very special program. That's a Wednesday evening. It's seven Wednesday evenings, a special health presentation by world-renowned Dr. Hans Deal. That's at 7 p.m. starting March 1, and it goes for seven Wednesday nights. The Pacific Union and our very own Loma Linda University Church's Resource Development Department have joined forces to create the Inspire Songwriting and Creative Writing Contest. If you are interested in participating in this, you can get more information online or you can get the flyer out at the UConnect Center in the foyer. The contest ends March the 23rd. So again, if you want information, check out our website or come out to the UConnect Center. And then this evening is the annual Winnegar Awards Vespers program. It's this evening at 4 p.m. Note the unique time right here in the sanctuary. And we're gonna be honoring four different incredible individuals. Doctors Brian Bull, Alvin Quirum, Verla Quirum, and Sigve Tonsted. There's going to be a special presentation related to the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther hammering the 95 Thesis on the Wittenberg door. This is going to be a special program. It's this evening at 4 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. And next week, February the 25th for Vespers, will be an organ recital by Angela Kraft, who will be dedicating a composition in memory of Will Alexander entitled To Make Man Whole. Again, that's next Sabbath at 4.30 right here in the sanctuary. And with that, for more information, you can check out our bulletin, the website, the app, or of course, go to Uconnect Center in the foyer. We'd really like to thank our team behind the cameras today. And until next time, that's it for announcements. Have a great Sabbath.
Good morning, and welcome to the Loma Linda University Church. I'm delighted that you decided to come here and to worship God together as a family. I'd also like to say thank you to all of you who are watching via the broadcast, whether you're streaming online, watching through our app, or through our broadcast partners, LLBN. Thank you so much. You are our extended family members. And I'm not just talking about my mom and my in-laws who are watching right now. I'm talking about all of you who consistently watch and worship with us here at Loma Linda. You are family, and we invite you all to worship. Today, some of you, your hearts feel dark, gray, and cloudy. Because although you wanted Sandy Patty tickets, they sold out and you weren't able to get any but I have a little sunlight for you today. Because if you really want to go to the Sandy Patty concert tomorrow, we still have tickets for the transept for any of you who would like to help volunteer. We still need some volunteers in a couple of different areas. We need some people to help in the morning with the uh, setup. We need some people after the concert to help with the cleanup. And we also need some people for security. And so if you really want to go to the concert, but yet you did not get tickets, there's still a chance for you if you'd be so kind and volunteer. If you are interested in volunteering, don't jump up and go to the Welcome Center right now, but right after this service, please go to the Welcome Center right out in our foyer and talk to the volunteer coordinators out there who will get you signed up and make sure that you get to be part of the Sandy Patty concert as well. Now, I want to invite up our beloved pastor, Pastor Randy Roberts, to give a very exciting announcement to us this morning. Thank you, Pastor Roy, very much. It really is a delight for me to make this announcement. Those of you who worship with us on a regular basis know we have been in a pastoral search because we have some open pastoral slots. I'd like to announce the end of that search in one of those cases. We have a new pastor for administration and member integration who will be joining us the 1st of April. His name is Pastor Joseph O., better known, known as Pastor Joey. Pastor Joey is a pastor down in San Diego at the San Diego Central Church. I want to show you a picture of Pastor Joey, first of all, and then I'll show you a picture of Joey with his family. He's a delightful pastor. He has... Interestingly, a lot of experience. You're looking at him and thinking, he looks really young. He is young, except that he has about 18 years of pastoral experience. And so, uh, comes with great credentials, comes with great recommendations, and our staff has just fallen in love with him and appreciated the opportunity to get to know him, and we look forward to working in ministry together. Pastor Joy's wife, Sarah, will obviously be a part of this as well. She's a marriage and family therapist, and they're two precious little girls. So we're just looking forward to having them. As I said, they will begin in April. Hopefully, we will have, be able to have them before that time and announce them, introduce them to you. But whenever that comes, I hope that you reach out, embrace them, welcome them to the Loma Linda University Church because we're delighted to have them. Thank you, Pastor Roy. Thank you, Pastor Randy. We're definitely excited to have Pastor Joey and his family come join us as our family. To prepare our hearts for worship today, I'd like for us to focus in on one of the Psalms. I like how it is translated in the New Living Translation in Psalm chapter 5, verse 7, which says, Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple with deepest awe. Today, I invite you to stop, take a moment, and prepare your hearts to go to a level of deepest awe as we worship our God today. Welcome to worship.
bow your heads with me. Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, our heads are bowed this morning and we humbly come to you into your presence. Lord, we're here to worship you, whether it's here in the sanctuary or we're watching online around the world. Lord, this morning, we ask you to join us in our worship. We dedicate our lives to you this morning, Lord. We ask for your praise, and we, Lord, as we go ahead with grace and knowledge, may we glorify your name now and forever, Lord. May our actions show your love. As your disciples, Lord, we, as your disciples, we ask that you come and, sh and help us to show our love to others as you have shown us your love. May we have compassion as your disciples for others and show your kindness just as you have shown it to us. And Lord, as your disciples, may we forgive others as you have also forgiven us. Lord, this morning we want to grow in you, in a lifelong journey with you. And now as we prepare our hearts for worship, Lord, I just ask you to please cleanse our hearts from the wrong things we've done this week and the way that we have not made you proud. And Lord, just take our sins, cleanse us. We want your righteousness. As Pastor Randy shares with us the sermon from Daniel, I ask you to please impress upon his words. May we be able to take something with us throughout this week that we can share with others. We pray all these things in your lovely name. Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone that's here, but especially good morning, young little ones. This is time for the children's story, and I want you all up here. So if there are any little ones out in our congregation this morning, could you come up here and have a seat? Have a seat here around. Oh, man, I love seeing all these guys. Great. Now, I don't want anyone to sit right here. Leave this open right here, okay? Okay, so leave this open right here. Right here, leave that open. Oh, good, good, good. Well, you see, this morning I'm going to tell you a little bit about family. And what better way to tell you about family than opening up a family album? You see here, I'm going to just show you right here. You see, this is me as a little boy, not too much on, so I'll kind of skip the page. That's probably not a good one. Oh, here's me with my brother and sister. You want to see that right there? Yeah, right there. My brother's a lot taller. He's got more hair. I'm losing mine already. Oh, and here, look at this. This is us at the beach. Oh, man. This is that one. Oh, this is when my brother was tickling me. Made me have to go to the bathroom really quickly. Oh, and here's one of us when we were playing soccer. Well, not me playing soccer, but my uncle was playing soccer with my dad and brother, and they were all playing nearby, and I was by the goal, you see. I was playing beside the goal. Where was I? Beside the goal, you see, and my uncle was going over right in front of the goal. I'm going to just move the ball right here. He was going right in front of that goal, and he was about to kick, and he looked over at me, and then he kicked, but the ball didn't go towards the goal. It went straight at me. And that ball just flew. And I fell to the ground, and I started to cry. And everyone stopped, like you guys stopped right now, and I just kept crying. <laughs> and I looked over at my uncle. And then I kept crying. <laughs> you see, sometimes family is not always nice. And it's not that they don't mean to be nice, but it just happens. Sometimes we have family members that hurt us, like your brother or your sister, or maybe even sometimes your mom or dad. You see, Jesus had people in his family that, you know, you could think, boy, they weren't very good people. But there's a Bible verse I want to tell you about today, and it says there in Colossians 3 that we are to forgive each other. So that means I looked over at my uncle. You know what I did after I stopped crying? <laughs> I looked over at him and I said, I still love you, Uyo. Uyo means uncle in my language. And I went over and I gave him a hug. And he gave me a hug too. You see, the thing is, boys and girls, we have to learn to forgive each other, even though sometimes as family members we hurt each other. So I want, I want you to help me. Could you help me for a moment? You two look like your brothers, right? Yeah. He's like, oh, yeah. I want you to hold this ball. Can you hold that ball? Okay. Now, Noah, I want you to grab that ball. Take that ball. Oh, you didn't ask. Oh, so, so you should say now, what do you have to say? You say, I'm sorry. Oh, very good job. Can you give them a round of applause? Man. You can hold that for me. Can you hold that right there? You see, when we hurt each other, we should apologize to each other. And some of you may have family members like my uncle who don't know how to kick the ball very well, and they hit each other. But you learn to forgive. So boys and girls, I want you to do something for me right now, okay? I want you to look at the person next to you and say, one day I may hurt you, and I'm sorry. So can you say that right now? One day I may hurt you, and I'm sorry. And now I want, to, I want you to give someone a hug next to you. Can you give them a hug? Can you give them a hug? Oh, good. Well, boys and girls, thank you so much for listening to my story about my family. 
and forgiveness. We'll see you next Sabbath. Take care. The blessing, the blessing of youth ministry and children's ministry is that we have so much to learn from our children. Sometimes you think, boy, you know what? I've got a lot to tell them. But it's almost like they've got a lot to tell us about forgiveness and gentleness. Kids are so much easier to forgive. Could we forgive like that with our family members? Could we forgive like that to people in our church when we get hurt? It is a singular privilege for me to stand here in the baptismal waters with Tori Pratt. The Pratt family have been friends of ours for many, many years. In fact, we first became acquainted with them while pastoring in Corona. And along the way, along came our children, and then suddenly they grew up. I don't know what happened. I had the wonderful privilege of dedicating this young woman as a baby, dedicating her to Jesus his service and his love and his ministry. It has been such a privilege and such a delight to see her grow into a beautiful young woman who still has a desire for Jesus and a heart for God. I asked Tori about baptism. Why do you want to be baptized at this point in time, Tori? And she said, I want to be baptized now because I've become more deeply aware of the love of God in my life. I've never felt closer to God than I do now. I've come to understand his love as a forgiving love, a love that cleanses us and washes us of our sins. And it is just something that has been reflected, I should say, in her attitude and our conversations and the opportunities we've had to discuss and study Scripture together. So Jesus has been working in her heart and in her life. But she has a very close and a very loving family that has been very much in support of her baptism today. Her mom, Cheryl, is here just behind the scenes here in the baptistry area. Her dad, Terry, is out in front of us, her brother, Tyler, and the rest of the family. So I would like to invite all the family members and friends of Tory Press to stand at this time to show your support for this moment in Tory's life. What a delight. On both sides of the church, Tory, there's your family and there's your church family. We're just so pleased that you're here to celebrate this very special moment in her life. You may be seated. Tori, I look forward to see what God is going to do in your life. He has his hand on you and he's had his hand on you ever since you were a baby. He's guiding and directing you. It's going to be exciting to see what directions he takes you, in what ways he molds you and changes you, and in what way he will use you, not only for friends in the church but to do something special for him in the world. I'm eager to see that. And now, Tori, because God has loved you with an everlasting love, because Jesus, his son, came to save you, and because his spirit has been working in your life, drawing you to himself, and because you have responded to all of that and desire to be baptized, it's my privilege as a friend and as a minister of the gospel to baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. in the tank by two very special young ladies. This is Joanne Lumentang, and she's one of our junior high leaders. Now, she comes off kind of coy a little bit, but she's mischievous. She likes to get in there and stir things up, and I love that about her. She's a leader. She gets others to follow her lead, and she loves Jesus Christ. I asked her why originally Joanne, why did you want to be baptized? And she said, I want to celebrate that Jesus Christ forgives my sins. She's 13. If all the 13-year-olds in the world 
felt like Joanne did, we would have a much better world. She loves Jesus and wants people to know it. I'd like to ask her friends and her family and all the junior high to stand right now in support of Joanne Lumentang. Awesome. Thank you. You may be seated. Joanne goes to Clement Middle School, and yet she interacts with all the leaders here in junior high, and she loves church. She loves to come on Friday night, and she's so ever faithful on Sabbath morning. I look forward to her smile. She's going to change the world. Because of that, Joanne, it gives me great pleasure to baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This too is a very, very special young lady. I look forward to seeing her smile. This is Isabel Genovez. We had to practice to make sure I get it right. Isabel Genovez. And she is joined by many friends and family. And why don't we have them stand right now? Family from out of town. They have a big celebration for her decision. Oh, that's awesome. You may be seated. Isabel is extremely uh, a gifted leader. She's kind of shy at first, but then she opens up. And if you know her, she'll open up big. And she becomes a leader of men and women. And I look forward to her taking a lead in the Adventist church one day. She sings. She plays the flute. And I asked her, too, um, Isabel, why do you want to be baptized? And she says, I love the Lord, and I want the world to know. I want to bear witness to what he has done for me. That just makes my heart sing. And I told both of these young ladies that there will be somebody in the audience today who makes a decision to be baptized because of their witness this morning. So it's a very blessed event. Isabel, because you're just so precious in the eyes of the Lord and to your family and to this congregation, and you're very special to me, it gives me great pleasure to baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a joy that I cannot describe to baptize young people in the name of the Lord. It gives us so great pleasure to to advance the kingdom in this way. If you too want to be baptized, we would love to walk with you along that journey. Let one of the pastors know, and we will get things started. Amen. Thank you. 
familiar story is found in Daniel chapter 5. In fact, the title of the chapter gives you a big hint as to what the story is, the handwriting on the wall. Remember when Belshazzar had a great feast and he brought the vessels of gold and silver that his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, to use for his own feast? Oh man, that was such a horrible decision. The fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote something on the wall. Talk about making a statement and getting someone's attention. God is the best at doing that, and he definitely used pretty creative methods for this story. Today, Pastor Randy continues his series in the book of Daniel with part five of 11 with a message entitled, When the Writing's on the Wall. What exactly did the writing on the wall mean? What does it mean for us today? Please join me as we read our weekly quotes in preparation of the message. Happy is the soul that has been awed by a view of God's majesty. Oh, for a spirit that bows always before the sovereignty of God. A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. In the church, we seem to have lost the vision of the majesty of God. Something to think about. We pray for each one of you today. May the Holy Spirit speak directly to your heart. Good afternoon. Today's scripture reading is taken from Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. You can also follow along in your pew Bible on page 1327. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared, and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. May the Lord bless the reading of his word.
When I was a child, maybe eight, nine, ten years old, in that range, I have a memory that I've been thinking about this past week. It was a very different time and a very different place. It was outside of this country, and it was a different era in terms of how parents and schools raise children. I can remember in that period of time a figure in our lives as kids. He was the headmaster, the principal. I'm not sure what they called him at that time and place. But he was the one in charge. And he was a very scary figure. That was the era when they still used corporal punishment, not just at home, but in the school. And he used it liberally. And it scared us deeply. We had the sense that he ruled this roost, and he ruled it with a rod of iron. We weren't sure always what would make him angry or what would upset him. And so I can remember us as kids, we always felt like we were kind of tiptoeing around, not wanting to do the wrong thing and suffer his wrath. Now, as I thought about it this week, I realized that how I'm going to characterize it now, I would not have been able to characterize it that way at that time. I was too young and didn't understand some of these realities. But if I were to look back now and were to give words, words today to what I felt then, I would say this. This was somebody that, in my view, was above being confronted by anyone else. He was just a larger-than-life figure. I couldn't imagine anyone calling him to task. I couldn't even imagine, as I thought about it this week, him standing before the judgment bar of God. He was bigger than God. That was my young mind and what fear did to it. You may have or have had someone like that in your life. Someone who frightens you, who scares you, that you're not willing to certainly not confront, not even willing to make suggestions to. They are just a larger-than-life figure, and they scare you. Could be, I hope it's not, but it could be a parent. Could be a teacher at school. Could be a boss at work. Could be somebody else somewhere else in your life. But most of us, somewhere along the road of life, have had that person who is frightening. You know the kind of person I'm talking about. In fact, I read a brief piece about Sam Bromfen. He was the then-time, then CEO of Seagram Company. He came into a boardroom one day where there was going to be a meeting that he was going to lead. There were people still milling about. There were some chairs open. Others were already in chairs. He walked in and he sat down and he called the meeting to order. At which point in time, young man to his right, an intern said to him, Sir, I think you're supposed to sit at the head of the table. He turned his eye on this young man and said to him, Young man, wherever I'm sitting is the head of the table. That's the kind of person I'm talking about. The kind of person who frightens you. You don't quite know how to relate to them. In fact, another story I encountered. I did some work to try to absolutely verify this. I can't totally, almost. From what I can tell, it's a factual event. In fact, I was even able to find YouTubes of the baseball game, though they did not include this moment about which someone wrote. Here's where it was. It apparently happened some years ago, the late 90s, mid to late 90s. It was a baseball game between Cuba and Venezuela. Now, if you've ever been in the Caribbean, you know that baseball, in a sense, is king. Love playing baseball there. So Cuba and Venezuela are playing a baseball game. As this game develops, Fidel Castro The dictator of Cuba strides out to the plate, picks up a bat. He's going to hit the next pitch. Everybody is watching. Well, when that happened, the gentleman who was on first base, a gentleman named Hugo Chavez, president of Venezuela, he went to the mound and said, then I'm going to pitch. And so he sent the first pitch Fidel's way. Didn't quite make it to the plate. Wasn't an auspicious beginning. But after that, he started bringing some heat. He pitched some balls, some strikes. In fact, they got to a full count, three balls, two strikes. Now, all eyes were on this. What was going to happen? 
He let loose that next pitch, and it flew straight through the strike zone, right there where Fidel could have hit it. The umpire behind the plate said, strike, you're out. Fidel dropped his bat, without even looking at the umpire apparently, said, that was a ball, and walked to first base. <laughs> the umpire said nothing. The other team said nothing. He his team said nothing. Hugo Chavez said nothing. And the game continued. In fact, commenting later on the incident, Castro is said to have just laughed and said about Hugo Chavez, well, it wasn't his best day of pitching. <laughs> That's the kind of person I'm talking about. The kind of person that no one wants to confront. No one wants to call to account. You may have had someone like that in your life. If you've had that, you know the fear and the sorrow and the struggle that that creates. We all know what it creates on a worldwide level because we all know the list of names, the tyrants of history, the Pol Pots of the world, the Joseph Stalins of the world, the Idi Amin's, the Adolf Hitler's. The list could just go on. No one can confront. No one can call to account. In fact, those under their power probably have a hard time picturing even God calling them to task. Well, to that list, add one more name. Add the name Belshazzar. Belshazzar, king of ancient Babylon. Our text today will tell us that Nebuchadnezzar was his father, it's actually a figure of speech. It would be better stated Nebuchadnezzar was his predecessor. But now it's Belshazzar who's on the throne in Babylon, and things are not looking good. Now remember, this is Babylon, the mighty dominant empire at that period of time in the ancient world. But things are happening about Babylon because somewhere an army is headed toward Babylon. The Persian army is coming. In fact, about 50 miles away up the river, they have had a bloody battle in October of 539, finally winning out and conquering that city. The following day, they crossed the Euphrates River, went to the next city they were going to conquer, and the city just laid down their arms, put up their hands, and said, no, 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 no fighting. We're done. We surrender. So the Persian army is marching marching on Babylon. Now, you would think at a time like that that a king like Belshazzar would have his defenses up, would be ready, would be listening carefully to the spy reports, might even be listening carefully to the steady tromping of feet as the army marches his direction. If you would think that, you would be wrong. Because what Belshazzar is doing is he's having a party, a raucous party. He's invited all of his nobles, all of his leading ladies. Everybody is there, a thousand nobles. They have all come to celebrate, we think. And there he is, Belshazzar, as the Persian army marches his way. He's drinking and laughing and having a party. The story is told in Daniel's book, chapter 5. I begin reading in verse 1. Daniel 5, 1 says this, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, or his predecessor, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. We're having a party. Now there's a bit of division of thought as to what exactly was happening here. On the one hand are those who say this was a celebration of certainty. 
This is Babylon. We are strong. We will not fall. Our city is impregnable. Our gods are powerful. Just you try to come and take us. So we have a party to celebrate the certainty that we're in control. Or on the other hand, the other way of thinking is that this is a party of the variety of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. We don't know what tomorrow is going to hold and so we may as well have a good time tonight. And that that's what they were doing. There is some cause to believe that the former may be the case, especially because of what Nebuchadnezzar does in commanding that the golden goblets, the utensils of worship from the Jewish temple in Jerusalem be brought to him. His predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had captured, decimated the city, and brought back these utensils of worship, these golden goblets, and had placed them in the, in the house, in the worship place of his God. Now, kings in the ancient world would have understood the reality of these kinds of utensils for worship. They would have understood that, that, that they generally were somewhat respectful of those kinds of things because they were viewed as sacred objects, although at times they were melted down and used to construct other things. However, Nebuchadnezzar had not done that. Had not melted them down. Instead, he had placed them in the house of his God, probably indicating that Nebuchadnezzar was making a statement saying, my gods are more powerful than your gods. I'll take what belongs to your God, and I'll put it in the house of my God. We can even use it there as the utensils of worship. But then along comes Belshazzar and says, I'll do you one better, Nebuchadnezzar. I'll bring them here into the party, into the house of feasting and drinking, and I will use them to toast the gods of iron and wood and stone, all of the gods of Babylon. And that's precisely what he does. It's as though he's poking a finger in the eye of Yahweh. Let's see whose God is more powerful. And they have a great party. Everybody celebrates. Until suddenly, in one stunning moment, everyone falls silent. Back to Daniel 5, verse 5. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall, near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Some scholars say there's a euphemism there that the language would actually support translating this differently. Translate it saying, as he was so frightened that his bowels were loosened and he soiled himself. Belshazzar is scared out of his mind. Picture what has just happened. From one moment in time, being the king of the world, holding aloft the golden goblets from that God over in Jerusalem, singing the praises of my God in the midst of all the other people of power, to the next moment, a shaking, soiled, stinking coward. A disembodied, bloodless hand writing words. Now, you know what Belshazzar does. Call the diviners, call the enchanters, call the magicians. You'd think by this time in Daniel they would have learned. This is the third time. And every time they come, your answer is the same. Uh, 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 I don't know. We can't say. But he calls them in anyway, only to get the same answer that Nebuchadnezzar twice before him received. We don't know. We can't read what's on the wall. And then it is, then it is says the text, that the queen mother comes in, comes in uninvited, unannounced, comes in and says, King Belshazzar, I know who you need. 
There's a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. He worked with your father, your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He interpreted things for him. You need to call him. Call Daniel. Now picture what that would have been like for Belshazzar. First of all, this is a conquered kingdom. Your own kingdom has destroyed them, has brought home all their accoutrements of worship. You have just been sticking your finger in their God's eye. And this, this is an exile. What does he know? I certainly don't want to call him in here to define and interpret for me something that comes possibly from a God that I have been mocking. But the queen is clear. Call Daniel. Call Daniel. He is the one you need. And so Daniel is summoned. Verse 13. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I've heard that the spirit of the gods is in you and that you have inside intelligence and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself. Give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. If you listen carefully, you pick up a clear disrespect on the part of Belshazzar toward Daniel. I've heard, I've heard, he says it a couple of times, I've heard you can do these things, if you can. Are you one of the exiles my father brought from Judah when we conquered your kingdom? Is that who you are? Putting him in his place. But at the same time, you can sense a very clear dismissiveness on the part of Daniel toward Belshazzar. He just responds and says, keep your gifts for yourself. Give your rewards to someone else. I don't need what you offer. I don't need it. Nevertheless, I will tell you what it means. You'll remember back that Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar seemed to have a somewhat cordial relationship at times. In fact, there were even moments when Daniel made expressions of empathy, of pathos toward Nebuchadnezzar. When he saw what the meaning of the dream was, he said, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, I wish this were for one of your enemies. I wish this were intended for one of your foes. There seems to have been a respect there. That's all gone with this young upstart of a ruler. This ruler who is obviously, by his day and time, never accustomed to being confronted, challenged, being told the truth. This ruler whose attitude was of the variety, when I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. This ruler who had control. And Daniel says... Keep your gifts. Give your rewards to someone else. I don't need them. I don't need you. But I will tell you the meaning of the writing. Now then in the text, then Daniel gives him a history lesson. I'm sure Belshazzar appreciated that. Gave him a history lesson. Said, let me tell you about your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. Because Nebuchadnezzar came to a point in time where he became high and mighty and lofty and full of himself. He thought he was in control of the world, so much so that the Most High God struck him down. He lost his mind, lived off the land like an animal until the moment came when he raised his eyes to heaven and recognized the Almighty. Then his mind was restored to him. But Belshazzar, He humbled himself. He repented. You have not. It's almost as though Daniel is saying, look, you've never been interested in me. 
You've never been interested in my word or the word of my God. Never. You're interested in the word of your God. You're interested in yourself. The hedonistic lifestyle that you live. All you want to know is what's within you. It's almost as though he's saying that. If he is, it strikes a resonant chord with our day and time. Ran across an excerpt from a book. I have not read the book. Some of you may have. It was a bestseller some years ago called Conversations with God, written by Neil Donald Walsh. Walsh says, I just begin to write down my conversations with God, my interactions with God, not the God of Christian faith, not the God of any other world religion, but the God of, of Walsh, that which was inside of him, the conversations he held with God in his own mind. It must have struck a resonant chord in the culture because it became a bestseller. Let me read to you one interaction between Walsh and his God. God. I cannot tell you my truth, Neil, until you stop telling me yours, Walsh. But my truth about God comes from you, God. Who said so? Walsh. Others. God. What others? Walsh. Leaders, ministers, rabbis, priests, books, the Bible for heaven's sakes. God. Those are not authoritative sources. Walsh. They aren't? God. No. Walsh. Then what is authoritative? God. Listen to your feelings. Listen to your highest thoughts. Listen to your experience. Whenever any one of these differs from what you've been told by your teachers or read in your books, forget their words. God. Resonant chord. Belshazzar has never been interested in the God of Daniel. Never been interested in Daniel's thinking or words until a bloodless, disembodied hand traces words on the wall. And then he calls for Daniel. Daniel, can you tell me what it says? Can you tell me what it means? Verse 22. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this, all that history of Nebuchadnezzar's. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Many, many tekel parson. This is what those words mean. Many. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, the singular form of parson. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. It's a bit hard for us if we don't take a moment to consider. It's a bit hard to understand why was it so hard to read. Well, understand that the words consisted of consonants, just consonants. And they were all written together. And so when you saw the consonants, if you were going to read them and then interpret them, you first of all had to decide where the breaks came, what formed different words, which consonants belonged together. And then you had to add the vowels to the consonants to decide what the words were. And once you had the words, then you had to decide what the words meant. What was their meaning for Belshazzar? In fact, Old, Old Testament scholar Sidney Greidness 
writes it this way, very helpfully, I thought. To give an example of the difficulty of this riddle in English, imagine that a string of eight consonants appears on the wall. P-N-D-N-C-H-L-F. In order to read this riddle, we would have to first decide where to place the spaces to identify the words. There are many possibilities. After weighing the various options, suppose we put a space after the third letter. The re this results in the letters P-N-D. Now we have to supply the proper vowels. Again, there are a host of options. P and D can be read as pinned, pined, pained, pond, pound, panda, and other English words. And that's only the first word. We have two or three more to go. And then we have to interpret what those words mean. An extremely difficult riddle. Small wonder the Babylonian wise men are stumped. They cannot even read the writing, let alone give its interpretation. So call Daniel. And Daniel comes and stands before the proud potentate who is now filled with fear. I want you to picture the scene. Here you have the man who to this moment in time is the powerful man surrounded by his lords and ladies. And in front of him you have a prophet who is now in his 80s standing before the king. He may be bent in body, but he is not bowed in spirit. He may have difficulty walking, but he has no difficulty speaking, even if it's speaking truth to power. His back may bow, but his spirit does not cow. He stands in the presence of power and opens his mouth to speak with courage. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. And he looks at the king. And he says, King, there are three words numbered, weighed, divided. Your days are numbered, O King. You have been weighed in the balances of heaven and found wanting. Your kingdom has been divided and given to others. Imagine the old prophet possibly leaning on a cane, speaking truth in the presence of what might be grim, life-ending threat. There he stands, and he speaks God's judgment. Now, I'll be honest with you and tell you, that part of God is not easy for me. It's hard for me to consider the judgment of God, the wrath of God as Scripture sometimes states it. I would much rather linger over the words of Jesus, let the children come to me, don't hinder them. These are the ones who make up my kingdom. Trying to picture him judging I would rather linger over the words of Jesus spoken in the crisp night air. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes might live. To picture him rendering a verdict. I'm more drawn to the God of, of John's pen. Whoever says they know God must love. Why? Because God is love. And now picture that God judging. I've struggled with that at times. And yet here I see Daniel standing before the king, confronting the person no one else would dare to confront with the word of God, with the judgment of God. 
Well, I found some help with my struggles. One of those places, not the only one, but one, is from a theologian named Miroslav Wolf. He too struggled with that concept of the wrath of God, the judgment of God. Seemed an antiquated notion, a, a notion for way back there in that day and time, not for our more enlightened age. And then war came to Wolf's homeland. I want to read to you what he says reflecting on those two themes. My last resistance, he writes, to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in the former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed and over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. Or think of Rwanda in the last decade of the past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. Hacked to death. 800,000. How did God react to the carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in grandfatherly fashion? By refusing to condemn the bloodbath but instead affirming the perpetrator's basic goodness? Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. Parent, if someone brutalized your child, tortured them, killed them, and you felt no wrath, would we call that love? And so Daniel says, Belshazzar, you have been called to stand at the judgment bar of God. And at that judgment bar, bar you have been weighed, found wanting. Your days are numbered. Your kingdom has been divided and given to another. The end comes swiftly. In fact, scholars and historians believe we actually know the date, the evening of October 11, 539 B.C., the morning of October 12, 539 B.C. This is what happened. The last words of the fifth, fifth chapter of Daniel. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. That Persian army just kept marching. And on that night, and we believe it is legitimate history, on that night, they diverted the flow of the Euphrates, which flowed under the walls of Babylon, diverted it into a marsh, and then the soldiers of the Persian army slogged and tromped through the mud and the muck and the mire beneath the walls and into the city and into a palace where Herodotus says Babylon fell in the midst of a celebration. And there in that celebration, they found Belshazzar. His name means this. Bel is another word for the Babylonian god Marduk. Belshazzar. Bel, protect the king. That is where he had placed his trust. And yet those warriors and their swords found their mark and his kingdom ended. But Babylon lives on. Babylon has lived on throughout human history in the examples of the tyrants and the despots and the dictators and every power-hungry, bloodthirsty person that has come along and has done great damage not only to other human beings but to the people of God. 
Babylon continues by those who coerce the conscience and therefore frighten anyone from standing up and confronting them. Babylon refuses to be held accountable until an old prophet, bent in body, but not bent in soul, stands and says, numbered, weighed, divided. His actions and his words will be echoed by another prophet many centuries later. A prophet on an island called Patmos. This prophet, we don't know, maybe 90 years old. Also bent in body but not stooped in soul who will pick up the refrain of Daniel 5 and who will write the words, another angel came crying out, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. She who made all nations drink the wine of her maddening adulteries, she's become the haunt of every demon, every unclean and foul spirit is in her. But God has judged her. In one night, the Lord God Almighty reigned. Two old prophets standing up and calling to account those whom no one else would. Their courage, their words are stunning. I don't know where you are today. It could be that somewhere in your life is a figure. Maybe, I hope not, maybe a parent, possibly a boss, a teacher, somebody in your world and community that scares you, that frightens you, whom you do not have the courage to confront. Or maybe your fear comes from the increasingly volatile international scene and what could happen next. If that's you this morning, then just know this. To every despot drunk on power, to every person who refuses to be held accountable, to every individual who wreaks harm and hurt and damage on other human beings, God, through his prophet Daniel, has a message. The writings on the wall. His message is simply this. Numbered. Your days are numbered. I only have two responses to that. Amen. And may it be soon. God of grace. If we are honest... Our hearts are deeply stirred by these aged warriors, by their courage, by their clarity of vision, and by the Spirit of God who lived within them. Gracious God, give us that courage. Let us dare to be a Daniel. Amen.
And again, hello, good friends. I'm so glad to be in touch with all of you. And as I always have the privilege of doing, I get to tell you about more dear friends. And right at the top of my list is a dear lady who deserves to be talked about every day, as far as that's concerned. And some of her family did not hear the greeting when we did it a week ago. So here goes again. Hello, dear Benita Welliber. We are so grateful to have you in our lives and to celebrate your 102nd birthday. Congratulations, dear Benita. And Alice and Leland Jewell. Listen to this, folks. This dear couple have been married 71 years, and we get to celebrate with you, Alice, and you, Leland. God bless you both. Geneva Art lives right here at the villa in Loma Linda. Hello, Miss Geneva. Happy, happy birthday, dear. Jeff and Greg Kapiniak. A couple of brothers whom I met a while ago who live in Canada. They were here with family, and this is their birthday. So happy, happy birthday, Jeff and Greg Kapiniak. And Kathy McCann, Kathy McCann McMillan, right here at the Medical Center. Such an important work Kathy does. And Kathy, we're glad to be in touch with you and wish you a very, very happy birthday here this month as well. In fact, you're one of those who is a Valentine girl. Happy birthday. Sung Nay, known as Pastor Kim at the Villa. And you have a birthday, sir. We wish you a very, very happy birthday. And get this one, everybody. Randy Roberts, our senior pastor, pastor whom we love so much. We are happy, Randy, to be able to honor you on your birthday this month. Happy, happy birthday. Many, many more, of course. Robin McGee. In Phoenix now, we're glad to welcome you folks back this far west at the Adventist Worship Center there. The very best to you, Robin, on your birthday, too. And right here in Loma Linda, Miss Jeannie Wiseman. Jean, I'm so proud of you. You're getting about and got to be with you last Sabbath. Happy, happy birthday, Jean Wyman. Wiseman, right here in Loma Linda. And another anniversary, Hilton and Doris Suddeth, Silver Spring, Maryland. Hello, you too. And happy, happy 71st birthday, if the notes I have are correct. We wish you the very, very best. And Sue Henson, Durham, North Carolina. Do we love your art, Sue? Happy, happy birthday to you. Meredith Torres, right here nearby in Glendale. We wish you a happy birthday too, Meredith. And here again at Loma Linda University Church, Ruben Yanez, who takes care of everything, has a wonderful crew of people who look after our facilities. And when you think things look good, it's because of Ruben's leadership. Happy, happy birthday, Ruben. Jeanette Edgerton, Portland, Oregon. Hello, Miss Jeanette. We wish you the very best on your birthday, too. Annette Frickman, also a part of the Loma Linda University family. Happy, happy birthday, Annette. Elaine Lawson Carter, also a part of this community. Miss Elaine, we wish you a very, very happy birthday, too. Calvin Willis, right here in Redlands, and somebody loves you, Brother Calvin, and said, don't forget to wish you a very, very happy birthday. Bernard Brandstater, if I get to sit near you in church, I love it because your resonant voice joins in the music and cheers us all. Happy birthday, Bernard Brandstater. And finally, Violet Molner. Hello, Miss Violet. Happy, happy birthday to you and best wishes to everybody who joins us for these greetings. <laughs> 